Please rise for the gospel reading. <clears throat> the gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 3, 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who, has, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths right, straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the regions about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with the water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the shaft he will burn with unquestionable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for this day, and thank you so much for gathering us here together, Lord. It is amazing, it's an amazing thing when so many people come together to hear about your word, Lord, and to praise your name. This truly is a wonderful thing. 
I pray you open up our hearts, our eyes, and our ears to what you have to say to us today, Lord. Allow us to listen to what John the Baptist has to say today to us. And I pray that that message rings true within our hearts. That the message that you want us to hear rings true in our hearts. And that when we leave this place, it doesn't leave our heads, it doesn't leave our hearts, but Lord, that we carry it with us throughout the next week, next month, within the next years. Once again, Lord, I pray that you open up our hearts and instill your gospel within it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. <clears throat> So, a bit of disclaimer at first. Uh, I'm a little sick. I don't know if you guys noticed. Uh, so, I apologize for any coughing, um, sneezing, or... Uh, um, yeah, hopefully that's it. Um, so, yeah, I apologize for that in advance. Um, please bear with me. Um, with that, it is that season, unfortunately. So, who here recognized the play that the Advent, CLB Advent Service is doing between the giants? Ah, we got a few. Ah, two, three. Aha. A little bit. <laughs> we got a little bit. So, ironically enough, that is exactly the same play that we did here almost three, four years ago. Our very first Christmas play between the giants. I don't know if you guys remember... I'm pretty sure most people here were there. If not, it was set in a coffee shop. Um, and there was like, there was the biblical, all the biblical characters ranged from Gabriel to the shepherds to the wise men. But they had these like modern day counterparts that would hang out in this coffee shop. And then they would have these conversations about church, about Jesus, about God, and about Christmas and stuff. And... Seeing that name up there again got me thinking, man, that play was really hard <laughs> to put together. There was a lot of challenges to come with it. Ask anybody here who was part of that play. There was a lot of preparation involved. There was a lot of challenge involved. I remember distinctly when my dad first came up to me and asked me to direct this play for Christmas, direct some kind of play for Christmas. And I wasn't quite sure what to expect. But to my surprise, I was met with a cast, a full cast of eight people, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about any kind of play, um, particularly one-act plays, that are usually only about two or three cast members um, big, Having a cast of eight is awesome. It expands so much of what you can do. So I remember being very excited. And as we progressed throughout rehearsals, got to know our characters, got to build the set, I saw that same fire within my cast members. Despite them always complaining to me about memorizing these lines, Always trying to remember these lines, and me always yelling at them to slow down their lines, to try to project their voice, and so on and so forth. They had lots of fun. I remember them asking, and even people after the play asking, so when's the next one? When are we starting the next one? There was this joy and this passion but then preparing for this play. But also there was a challenge <laughs> as well. Once again, memorizing lines was really hard. I remember Mary's character, Leanne's character, in the back there. She had this whole two-page monologue at the end that I'm pretty sure, even on performance date, she had the script up there with her just to make sure she didn't forget anything. And I'll say, monologues are hard to memorize. So I, I, I sympathize for her. But despite the challenge and despite some of the frustrations that we faced within this play, there also still was joy. 
and love, grace, and kindness within that preparation. And today's Advent service is all about preparation. Within those little sheets that were at the front when you guys came in at the door, it says the second candle, the Bethlehem candle or the candle of preparation. God kept his promise of, of a savior who would be born in Bethlehem. Preparation means to get ready. Help us to be ready to welcome you, O oh God. So this Advent service today, this lighting the second candle means to be prepared. Well, the question is, prepare for what? The question is, to prepare, oh, how do we prepare, even? All these other questions. Well, I think today's gospel reading, John the Baptist, answers that quite well. Let's quickly reread the gospel reading. I'll reread it for you guys. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of, th spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John claws were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out from him, from him, uh, him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw, but when he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you, out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees. And every tree that doesn't produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptized you with water for repentance. But after he comes, one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not even worthy to carry, he will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So... All, most of the, all the Gospels talk about this guy named John the Baptist. He was uh, said to be jo um, Jesus' cousin, born from Elizabeth. And he, within the beginning of all the other Gospels, he also takes a part within the beginning of the other Gospels. However, within Matthew's Gospels in particular, John the Baptist seemed very rude, would be a word. I don't know, just imagine people coming towards you and you just yell at them, you brood of vipers! Who here hears that these days? Imagine me coming up here in my beginning of my sermon, I'm just like, you brood of vipers! How many of you guys would want to walk out the door? It's not, it's not something you would say when you want someone to listen to you. Usually that's, okay, and you walk the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> but John the Baptist, he's a particular kind of man. He's really to say it as it is. Also as well, John the Baptist, the way he's described as well, he's living out in the wilderness, out in the middle of nowhere, wearing only camel's hair and a leather belt around him. And his food was of locusts and wild honey. Now once again, imagine there's a guy 
dunking people in a river. I don't know, Red Deer River, sure. He's dunking people in Red Deer River. He's, not, he's wearing nothing but a camel's hide. I don't know where he got it, but he has a camel's hide for some reason. He has a leather belt, and all he eats is locusts and honey. I don't know where he gets locusts in Canada, but he's eating it. Now, that's the kind of situation where you maybe call the cops. Or you stay away. That's, that's maybe the pinnacle of stranger danger. Right? But yet, despite these things, these kind of maybe red flags that we definitely would take as red flags during, this to um, during today, it says in the next verse, in verse 5, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region, the Jordan. Despite this crazy guy, the o I like to think John was like the OG redneck. You know, he was like, we think we have rednecks out here. Think of like John the Baptist. He was the original redneck out there in the wilderness, fending for himself. Anyhow, I digress. This guy, who most people would call as crazy at this point, drew people from all around. People from Jerusalem, people all around Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Tons of people came. And not just to be baptized, but to hear him preach as well. In the beginning of this chapter, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He was preaching as well, baptizing. He had disciples as well. And all this says, tells us that John the Baptist was more than just a crazy guy in the wilderness eating locusts and honey all day, but that he had wisdom. He had God's wisdom that he wanted to share with everyone else. And ironically enough, too, John the Baptist shares a lot of similarities to Jesus, to the point where people thought John the Baptist was Jesus, was this Messiah to come, and that they were expecting him to rise from the dead after he was killed. To say the least, despite the small amount of time John the Baptist gets, and despite how we kind of gloss over him sometimes, he's a very kind of he's a very important he's a very important person, character within the narrative of the gospel, to the point where he fulfills a prophecy. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, a voice one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John the Baptist is fulfilling a prophecy, the prof part of the prophecy, which is Jesus coming, dying on the cross. This is Messiah to come to save the world. This is another, another reason for why, for another reason why we can see the promise is being fulfilled by God in this moment. As it says in this little, this little pit, uh, sheet, God kept his promise of a savior who would be born in Bethlehem. This prophecy being fulfilled is another step of evidence the promise is being fulfilled, that God is keeping his promise. However, though, today is not just about promises. But today is about preparation. Well, preparing for what? And how do we prepare? These are really great questions that often we just kind of gloss over. People tell us, prepare during this time of Advent. Prepare, prepare. Well, what does that mean? When it's in this day and age where Jesus has died on the cross for us, the promise has been fulfilled. We live in now the time of the new covenant. What do we prepare for now? And most importantly, how do we prepare? Well, and I think in this reading, John tells us quite clearly. In the bottom half of verse 11 to 12, 
John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork and in his hand, and he will clear the threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Many people interpret this language with fire with Pentecost. And then they just kind of stop right there. Which I do agree. There is some connection to Pentecost here, particularly with verse 11. At the end of verse 11, the Holy that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. There's most definitely kind of a reference towards the foreshadowing towards Pentecost. Tongues of fire, and so on and so forth. However, though, in the latter half, of the, at the end of verse 12, it says, His winnowing fork in his head, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat onto the barn, and burning up the shaft with unquestionable fire. Sounds familiar. What I believe what John is talking about is not just the coming of Jesus, but also talking about the end of days. When Jesus won't just come to die on the cross, but comes back a second time. Comes a second time, riding on his white horse. The end of days. That's also what he's talking about. And even it says earlier on, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. It's talking about the end of days here. However, there is also that definite connection with Pentecost, with the Holy Spirit and fire. So now we kind of have an idea, okay, what we're preparing for, both in the context of the Bible, preparing for Jesus coming, being born by the Virgin Mary, but also by the second coming. Jesus coming again. He promises. He promises he will come back again. But the question is, though, how do we prepare? How do we prepare for the second coming? Well, once again, John makes it quite clear. Within this passage, he says repent a lot. He says repent quite a bit. He says in the beginning, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. When he's talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees, um, he says, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. John the Baptist's whole theme is kind of about repentance. Repent. Now, repent is a scary word, to say the least. I don't know about you, but growing up, I kind of had this idea of repent coming from... I had, I had this vision of what repent was, and that it usually involved either a hooded guy with a bell. I don't know why. I imagined a bell yelling this bell and screaming, repent, repent, the end is nigh, repent, repent. And everyone's just kind of walking past him, just trying to avoid eye contact. That was kind of the, the vision I had that came with this word, repent. You know, and it's, it's a heavy word. It's a word that often people don't use today. And if you do use it, you're kind of labeled as crazy. Because people just kind of have that automatic vision of, you know, this crazy person yelling, repent, repent, the end is nigh. However, the word repent isn't that crazy, though. It's, it's not really actually that heavy. Repent, what really means, it means just to change your mind, to turn around, to gain a new perspective. An example of this is, for example, it's been really icy on the roads. Let's say you've been driving. Right? And it's getting icy, but uh, who cares? I'm going to go the speed that I want to go. We start going above the speed limit. You know, start hitting 60, 70. Next thing you know, it's icy. You try to brake. You skid, and you end up in the ditch. Who here has wound up in the ditch before? 
There we go. Exactly right. It happens. It happens, right? But and then uh, you get out of the ditch. You call the tow truck or call a friend or whoever. They get you out. And then afterwards, you learn. You learn, okay, going above the speed limit, especially when it's snowy and icy, is not the best idea. So you repent. You repent. You gain a new perspective and you change your mind. However, it's not a feeling of changing your mind. It's like, oh, I feel like I should do this or I feel like it. It's a choice you make. It's a choice. You choose to repent. You choose to change your mind about something and to turn it around. You choose to drive either speed limit or lower during icy conditions because you repented. And he also says to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. When we give our life to Christ, when we follow the path of Christ, we don't just say, yes, okay, Jesus, I'm your child, I accept you into my life, I'll go to church, and that's it. That's not the end of the story. What God does, because he's so loving and gracious, he works with us and works through us. There's a reason why John is saying, repent, repent. And he even says to the Sadducees, we have, a don't, do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. He's not saying, don't just simply just sit in the comfort of, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God. I'm a child of Abraham. But that when you do give your life to Christ honestly, you're reborn to a new person. You repent who you were before and you walk a new path. You walk a new path that produces fruit. James says that works without what is it? yeah faith without that's the thing faith without works is fruitless now he's not saying in that verse that oh our salvation is connected to our works no 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 I don't want to send out that message that is not the gospel but what he's saying is that when we do give true faith in Christ true faith in our father produces fruit. True faith in our Father, true faith in Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us involves repentance. And it involves fruit. That is what he is saying. However, at the end of the day, all of this is pointless without one special ingredient. One necessary ingredient that no matter how hard we try, we can never, ever bring forth. This one special ingredient, this key ingredient, is forgiveness. And Jesus, coming to die on the cross for us, Dying on that cross, taking all our sin. Through this, he forgives us. He makes repenting and bearing fruit possible through his forgiveness. It's through his power. He rises us up. We don't rise him up. So through Jesus' forgiveness, through him coming to earth, humbling himself as a man, walking on the earth as a man, showing us the way 
the truth and the life. And dying on the cross for us and saying, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Through his sacrifice and his resurrection, he forgives us, making this whole preparation possible. It was all fruitless without him, without his forgiveness. And oftentimes we forget about that. We forget to have faith in that. That Christ has forgiven all our sins. And by having faith in that, repentance, bearing fruit, are all possible. And all, oft, oftentimes I hear people say, well, I'm not worthy. If you know the things I've done, how could someone like Jesus forever forgive me? This is something that we ask ourselves quite a bit within our heads. Even those who are most devout Christians still ask that sometimes. If you know what I've done, who could ever forgive me? I sure wouldn't. And you're right. You're not worthy. But I have good news. Jesus doesn't care. He loves you all so so much that he doesn't care if you're worthy he doesn't care what you've done what terrible things you've done but he will always forgive you I'll leave with you guys with one verse in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 it says when you pass through the waters I will be with you and when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep you over. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. It's through his strength that any of this is possible. It's through his sacrifice and through his love that we could even begin to even think of repenting and bearing fruit. Not just any fruit, but good fruit. Fruit that will move across the globe. Fruit that we may not ever see become fruitful, but fruit that will last in eternity. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are so, so good to us. And you love us oh, so much. I pray that you remind us of your love. I pray you remind us that there's more to following your path, more of being a disciple of you than just coming to church on Sunday. But there is repentance within that. That when we accept you into your life, there's a rebirth. There's a new identity to claim. But also, Lord, I pray that this identity, this repentance, we can't do it alone. But we do it through you. We do it because you died on the cross because you love us so much and because you're with us. When we pass through those waters, you are with us. When you pass 
When we pass through the rivers, you are with us. When we walk through the fire, you are with us. Always working with us and working through us. Shaping and forming us. Not into the people we think we need to be, but into the people you want us to be. Into your beautiful creations. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please rise for the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the holy begotten Son of God, begun of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now go prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you stir the hearts of your faithful to prepare us for the advent of your Son. We implore you, feed us continually with your word and sacraments as we look for his return. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, by the ministry of your holy church, prepare the way for your son's return in glory. Send forth faithful pastors to proclaim your law and gospel and grant hearers ears to listen and hearts to receive their words in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, you preserve Jesse's faithful line by the incarnation of your son. Give families and individuals strength to faithfully fulfill their vocations, to love and forgive one another, that we may be trained up in your, in your fear, love, and trust. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, your Son rules over creation with justice and righteousness. And to those in authority with the desire and ability to protect the innocent, punish the wicked, and work for the common welfare. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate Lord, as we await the day when the wolf will dwell alongside the lamb and pain and destruction are no more, grant us patience, comfort, and healing according to your will. Hear our prayers for all the sick, especially Norm and Jenny, Pastor Keen, Louis, Erna, Denise, Letha, Barb, and Fred. Give wisdom and skill to all medical professionals who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, 
Grant that we may be kept in joy and sustained in hope through every trouble and trial in this mortal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray all together. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Be seated for the offering. your own in any gifts we bring all that we have is yours alone or trust from you our king may we your bounties thus as stewards true receive and gladly lord as you bless us to you our first fruits give Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please rise for the closing hymn.
Go in peace and serve the risen Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.